Cry Lesbian of Sodom absolutely changed my life. This was first produced in 1985, and, well, I'll never forget the opening night because the day before it opened, I was an office temp, and the day after it opened, I was a, a actor and playwright who could earn their living in the theater, and that really was my great, great dream. A friend of mine was this very exotic lady who was a performance artist, and she was performing in this very peculiar uh, kind of after-hours bar art gallery in the most grim, strange neighborhood in New York City. It was called Alphabet City, far in the Lower East Side. And at the time, in the mid-80s, only the deranged would ever go there. It was so scary and dangerous. Well, I saw her act, and I was so entranced by the whole ambiance of this strange club. It was called the Limbo Lounge that immediately I'd, I just ran over to this young kid who was the owner, and his name was Michael Limbo, and, and he was a wild looking kid. He was kind of a handsome guy, but he uh, had shaved his head halfway back and the rest was dyed bright red. He, he kind of looked like Daniel Day-Lewis playing Elizabeth I. Anyway, I said to him, I would just love to perform in, in your club. And it was very loose. He just looked at the calendar and said, what are you doing in three weeks? So I said, I'll take it. And I, I had to write something, just something very decadent and outrageous. So I was working as an office temp, and you know, between you know, when I should have been you know, answering the phones, I just started you know, typing this little play. Uh, and uh, I wrote it very quickly, and I called all of my dearest friends who uh, had all been basically told they were unemployable in the theater. And we rehearsed it about five times, spent about, really honestly, about $36 on the whole thing. Uh, and we just, we each, in, well, we each invited about 10 people and we were sold out. It just, uh, it kind of took off. And we, we kept doing another weekend and another weekend. And eventually, there were lines down the block to see Vampire Lesbians of Sodom. And it just really kind of struck a chord at this specific time in the East Village. And we got all this publicity. People Magazine would come and do stories on, on this little troupe. Finally, it got to the point where it, it just was so uh, kind of bigger than the Limbo Lounge. So we decided to, to produce the show off-Broadway in a real theater. And we opened at the Provincetown Playhouse, which was kind of a, a thought of as a jinxed off-Broadway house, but it had a very wonderful history. And it was an absolute rave for the New York Times. And it was particularly touching because every single person in the cast uh, got mentioned and got a rave review. All these kids who had been so discouraged. And I knew at that moment what it meant that I actually could earn my living in the theater, which was my great dream. And uh, the show ran five years. It's one of the longest running plays in the history of Off-Broadway. Vampire Lesbians of Sodom is a, a, a tricky play. It's not as easy as you might think to uh, to really produce correctly. On one hand, it's a series of almost like vaudeville sketches. But it's very important for the actors to, to maintain a through line of who these outrageous characters are, to always remember that the play essentially, with all, if you take away all the exotic trappings, it's about a friendship. It's, uh, although these two ladies go back in time 2,000 years, you should almost think of it as a metaphor for any really long-term friendship that has its ups and downs and, and rivalries and, and uh, disappointments and, and, and triumphs. And to always to have fun with the style and make it big and, and outrageous, but always have a, a core of reality to it.